Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. Previously in EC 2026 Introduction to Signal Processing, we've looked at finite impulse response filters. In those lectures, I would often say things like, for FIR filters, this is relatively simple, but when we get to infinite impulse response filters, things will be much more complicated. Well, it's time for things to get more complicated. Let's start looking at IIR filters. Such filters form the basis of most equalizer plugins for digital audio workstations, as well as algorithmic reverberation. As you might expect from the name, IIR filters have infinitely long impulse responses. We'll achieve this by using feedback. So the output value at a given time might involve previous output values and not just input values. This contrasts with FIR filters that don't use that kind of feedback. Nowadays, we'll generally implement these using digital signal processing, but there's nothing in the theory I'm about to describe that requires anything to be discretized in amplitude. So you could generalize this to a discrete time filter where maybe you're implementing it using analog techniques using bucket brigade devices. When we talked about FIR filters, they could be causal or non-causal. The IIR filters we'll look at in this class are inherently causal. If we don't have this first term here, then this just looks like our original FIR filter with our familiar filter coefficients BK that are weights placed on the inputs. But now we'll include up to N feedback terms where the weights on the outputs that are being fed back are given by filter coefficients A sub L. When we were talking about FIR filters, we referred to M as the order of the filter. When we talk about IIR filters, we usually refer to N as being the order of the filter, and well, M is just whatever it is. It's just hanging out. In this lecture, we'll focus on the first order case, so we'll just be looking at the output one time step in the past. When we looked at FIR filters, we saw that we could relate the time domain to the frequency domain using the system function. The same is going to hold true for IIR filters. Before we go on, let's review some ideas relating to delay systems. Delaying a system by ND corresponds to a system that has an impulse response of delta in minus ND, and it has a system function that's Z to the minus ND, and to get the frequency response, we plug E to the J omega hat in for Z. So let's look at an example where M equals 1. So we're going to use the current input and the previous input scaled by B0 and B1. And we're going to add to that the result of the previous output multiplied by A1. To be consistent, we might imagine that Yn is being multiplied by a coefficient A0, but that's always 1. And this A0 isn't entirely consistent with this B0 because notice all the Bs are on one side of the expression, but A0 is on the left. I'll talk about that more later. Now, in order for this kind of feedback to make sense, we'll always be talking about causal filters. There's a convenient MATLAB command called filter that lets you filter a signal using one of these kinds of filters. Now, if I get rid of this minus 0.8 here, that gets rid of this term, and we can see this is the form we previously introduced for implementing an FIR filter using the filter function. Notice that when we included this feedback coefficient of 0.8, we actually changed the sign. The underlying idea here is that we imagine moving all of the Y terms over to the left-hand side. So when you do that, the signs flip on everything except the implicit one that's sitting in front of the Y in. So for this kind of filter, you might think about the coefficients as being 1, 0 0.8, if you're thinking about this kind of form up here, and you're writing A0, A1. Or you might think about this as containing the filter coefficients. So when people talk about the feedback coefficients of an IR filter, you need to check to see what convention they're using. Let's look at a first order IIR filter with a feedback coefficient of 0.8. And here we're only using the current input and we're multiplying it by five. Let's see what the output looks like for the input sequence two 
minus 3, 0, 2. At first glance, it looks like we have a chicken and egg problem. To figure out what y0 is, we will need to know what y minus 1 is. And to figure that out, we will need to know y minus 2. So we need to make some assumptions. We usually assume what's called the at-rest initial conditions. So we're going to assume that there's no input before n equals 0. So we can assume that there's no output for n less than 0. So that y of n minus 1 equals 0. Now remember, x0 was 2. So we take 2, multiply it by 5 to get 10. And that basically provides the base case for our recursion. And if we have a higher order filter, we use the same kind of initial rest assumption. So to get y0, we would assume that y minus 1 and y minus 2 are all 0 in the second order example. Second order filters do some interesting things. We'll talk about that later. Continuing with this first order example, we just saw that y0 was 10. So we plug that in here in order to find y1. Remember, x1 in our input sequence was minus 3. And plugging that all in gives us minus 7. Now to get y2, we plug minus 7 in for y1. Remember, x2 is 0. So 0.8 times minus 7 gives us minus 5.6. We take minus 5.6, plug that in for y2. And remember, x3 was 2. So we compute that out and get 5.52. And at this point, we run out of input. So to get the remaining values, we take this 5.52 and then multiply it by 0.8, and then multiply it by 0.8, and then multiply it by 0.8, and then that pattern continues. So we have this complicated behavior at the beginning, but once we run out of input, we have this decaying exponential kind of behavior. Let's think about finding the impulse response of this general first order filter. I know that I can plug in a delta for x to get the impulse response h. If I look at this general form, remember we're assuming that the output is 0 at n equals minus 1. So we put a 0 here, and then to get h of 0, well, I just take 1 and multiply it by b0, which gives me b0 here. And then at the next step, I take that b0 and I multiply it by a1, but now I don't have any more input. So I just keep repeating this pattern of multiplying by a1, multiplying by a1, et cetera, et cetera. So looking at the output here, it's clear we have this general form of b0, a1 to the power of n. To note this is for n bigger than or equal to 0, we'll put a unit step function here. Now this is super important. On an exam, if we ask you for the impulse response of an IIR filter, we don't want this implicit form. No, 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 no. We want this closed form formula. Or I mean, whatever the correct closed form formula is for that particular problem. This is the correct formula for that particular problem. Here we set up this table horizontally. Sometimes people like to set up this kind of table vertically. Now, in this particular case, it's not too difficult to see the pattern. But for more complicated filters, this can get pretty hairy. In a future lecture, we'll see how Z-transforms provide a convenient way for finding the impulse response of IIR filters. So we can use this general formula to find the impulse response of this particular filter. And we could describe the output for any input in terms of the convolution of that input with that impulse response. But this is more of a theoretical thing. You can't brute force run the convolution summation on something that's infinitely long. If you're actually implementing the filter, you use the difference equation. But this kind of formulation may provide mathematical insights. Plotting the impulse response, we see this nice decaying structure. Now, that decaying structure happens because this filter coefficient here is less than 1. If this filter coefficient was greater than 1, then we would have exponential growth. Now, that doesn't really give us a useful filter. That won't have a well-defined frequency response. But we might use such a system to model real-world processes such as population growth.